Welcome to Empowerment TV and the Empowerment Podcast. I'm Dawn Payne, and I'm here to help you create your dream life and business. I have been interviewing some absolutely incredible people, and I have a really interesting woman here today. Uh, the interview was fascinating. She's Canadian, but she's been work- working and living in Istanbul, Turkey for 17 years. She's built and sold a business. She's built another, a second business and is expanding it. And she's just a very interesting woman. And I think the lesson she shares in creating and building a business, but also living a life is invaluable. So her name is Jennifer Gaudet. Please enjoy. I'm excited for you to have this experience. Welcome to Empowerment TV and the Empowerment Podcast. Thank so you. Fun. Hey, yeah. I'm so excited to have you uh, for this interview chat. And uh, I did a really, really good look at your website. So I want to start with oh, something thank you. from your website. It's beautiful, by the way. Um, and your products are gorgeous, which thank you. I knew because I've seen them before, but you know, doing a deeper dive was was super fun. So I pulled some things that I thought were, um, I guess, really touching for me. And I want to start with that. And then I want to explore a little bit more kind of how you got into this business and kind of a little bit more around how you can actually build something on passion and on purpose and and that type of thing. So because I think you're just such a good example of that. So from your website, which is Jennifer's Hammam. 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 Hammam means Turkish bath. Okay. And I looked that up, actually. Hammam. All right. There you go. We've got the, the, the saying correct. So, an example to the world of how to empower people, save cultures, heal economies, sustain the planet, and have an amazing time. Yay. Yay. And and knowing you, this fits perfectly. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how you came to this, how your values started to be built into your business. Um, the idea to look for the product came while I was doing my first business here in Turkey, which was a cafe and art gallery. Yeah, And it was mostly because people would ask me, where can I go to shop for this, that, or the other thing where I won't get ripped off? People won't cheat me. Right. As, as in most, it's not just about Turkey. Any tourist area in the world tends to gather its share of opportunists because tourists don't know any better. And I knew the answers to most of the questions, except when people said, where can I find good Turkish towels? I thought, why isn't anybody doing this? Everybody loves good towels and Turkey's famous for them. So it just sat percolating. And uh, when I got a wonderful offer on the on the cafe, and six days later, my now husband told me about a shop in the Arasa Bazaar that was coming up and was very pushy about taking it. And it hadn't been announced yet. And they would usually, yeah. at that time, they would disappear in 10 minutes. He was like, you have to take it. You have to take it. Um, and I did, even though I had other plans and was going to wait to to do this idea. And then he said, what do you want to put in it? And I said, well, I want to put the authentic, real Turkish towels that have been hand woven. I don't want this machine made stuff. He said, oh, that's easy. And it wasn't easy because most of it had disappeared. It took us six. I forced him to come with me to look for it because he was so pushy about taking the shop. It took traveling to the two main centers that the Ottomans supported for weaving to find out that was just big, big factory. And in one of them, also a little bit of small factory. And then six days of driving around the countryside, asking people and looking for clues to find one person left with a few looms. So I think that in answer to your question, the first part of it is like, oh my gosh, this has almost disappeared. 
that one person led us to eight more that had a few looms that were still going, but that was all that was really left. And even my husband, who thought it was going to be like a snap of a finger to go find this, because before the whole country was a weaving country, he was shocked at how it had deteriorated. So the man that does our thick looped towels, what you would call a terry towel, we met him 10 days before the scrapyard was to throw away his two and only looms. Now, I didn't know that at the moment. I found it, that out a little bit later. And then the people all doing the flat weaving items that we do, they were within three to six months of, of uh, going bankrupt. When you go from, I'm buying something from someone and it's special and putting in, it in the shop, to I'm buying things from people who are about to go bankrupt and an art is being lost. I don't know. There's just a whole shift in your thinking about it. And you feel rather passionate about trying to make sure, boy, I really have to do a good job now. Otherwise, if I don't, I can't reorder and these people will still disappear. And that would be sad and bad. Mm -hmm. So that's where it started. And it built from there as you get to understand and know, I mean, I've had many textile people come into the, the shop and what they learn in university these days, I have no idea what they're talking about. But what I've learned from the weavers, they don't know what I'm talking about either. So there's this huge gap in knowledge. And I feel like I've been gifted an honorary university degree in what's going on in weaving, even though, I mean, I know the mechanics of weaving, but you would never buy anything I made. I do understand the effort that goes into it. Mm -hmm. So all of that starts to come together to you start to become rather passionate about making sure that this continues. And then your customers start coming back to you with wonderful comments. It's so wonderful to open up my email every day with, oh, I just love my towels. I've been using them for the last 13 years or nine years or whatever. And I mean, it just makes you happy because, you know, Ah, another thing that's not going into the landfill, another person that's happy that understands quality and we're still supporting this, this slow, it's not fashion, but it is sort of on the cusp of slow fashion, getting mm -hmm. people working and doing something that's, that's supporting the planet. Mm -hmm. so, rather long winded answer, but it all kind of goes together. Yes. No, I love it. I love the story. I love the passion that was created as well. And that not only can you support a culture and, um, you know, and something that was on its way out, but actually really important, but still have a way to help other people through the business, right? Like selling the products and people love them. And one of the things I learned, and, and again, love to ex you to expand on it is the types like the cotton and the silk and what you use is not only good for the planet, but it's actually higher quality for the client as well, from what I could tell. Um, can you talk about a little, a little bit about that too? Because I, what I find fascinating is there's so many like grounded earthy things is kind of how I would say it, right? Like people, planet, support, um, yeah. So whichever direction that kind of takes you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So at the moment, um, the, the, the majority of the focus is it was always cotton, but mm -hmm. there's less linen and silk at the moment, partly because of supply chain problems with the linen. I haven't been able to find linen fibers. And you have to understand that industry took us out of linen and put us into cotton. Mm. Um, linen is the bee's knees, and it was used for millennia, but mm. it's a very hairy and un uneven fiber. And unless it's twisted super, super tight, it when you twist it super tight, then you can clear off all the threads and you can even it out. And then it can be put into machines that are going, they just have an on and off button and they go way, they go much faster than we do. Um, but if you're going to use the kind of threads that we do, mm -hmm. you can't put that on the machine. Mm -hmm. And why can't we use the tight threads? Well, we can for sheets. They could when they're doing machine made things for like a shirt or a pair of pants. But for a towel, that would feel like 10, 
sandpaper 10 times over. <laughs> right. So you need a different thread and we have to go 50% slower to accommodate linen. Mm -hmm. And why do you want linen? Because it lasts even longer than organic cotton and it, it holds 40% of its own weight in water without feeling wet. So it kind of goes linen, organic cotton, it drops way down to non-organic cotton. Mm -hmm. So when we shift into cotton, which is no problem in Turkey to find because we're top, usually top three in production of the world, both mm -hmm. in organic wow. and non-organic. So I never have problems finding that and I only buy organic. It's GOTS certified, which is Global Organic Textile Standard Certified. That's a European Union standard that's slowly moving also into North America. It's very respected worldwide. I don't have to worry about following farmers or the people that process it. But what I, I do know is the great thing about the planet side of things is non-organic growth of cotton takes approximately 10 times more water. Mm. Just that alone already makes it much more attractive to do organic as opposed to non-organic. Mm -hmm. But then there's all the chemicals that they're using. So you're contaminating the water supply, you're contaminating yes. the soil. And in Turkey, you're contaminating the people that are hand picking the cotton. Right. So planet side, organic cotton wins hands down. Yes. For the end user, it's the processing that you should really care about because when they process non-organically, they're trying to do you a favor. Organic cotton's not absorbent and it's got lots of fluff. So they use these chemicals to get rid of the fluff and make it absorbent off the shelf. When you buy it, you take it home and that's it. You're using it. But the chemicals they use made it hard, so they use different chemicals to make it feel soft so you'll actually buy it. That wears off in about a year, and non-organic cotton's not as absorbent. It doesn't release the moisture properly. It starts to smell musty over time, mm -hmm. and it goes hard when those other chemicals wear off. So right. the biggest complaint is always, my towel stinks after just two or three uses, and it's hard. Yes. Organic cotton doesn't have that problem. The price you pay is yes. you have to teach the cotton how to be absorbent. And I didn't know anything about this at the beginning. So clients were writing me back and saying, my towel's not absorbent. There's something wrong with it. And oh, it shoot. took a lot of teas and hours and Turkish talking because yes. nobody volunteers information. These mm -hmm. jewels and gems sort of came out over time. And it was like, oh, my God, why didn't you tell me that? And it's like, well, you never asked. It's like, I don't even know what to ask. <laughs> Come on, uh, it's important. <laughs> yeah. I learned that everybody yeah. in Turkey knows, but none of the rest of us knew that you, you have to soak cotton and you teach okay. it how to be absorbent, which isn't a big price to pay, yes. especially with what you end up with and all the feedback we get from the clients, we know it's the right thing to do, even though organic threads, unfortunately cost a lot more to buy than non-organic, which I think is so unfair mm -hmm. because we're the one doing the favor for everybody. And it should be the other guys that are punished, but we all know that's not how things work at the moment. Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But worth the price as well. Like you said earlier, Absolutely. these things last for decades if you know if they will last probably. much longer the yeah. longevity of it and also you know towels you're using on your skin and we all know from using things like patches whether it's to stop smoking or or get different kinds of drugs to absorb into our skin our skin does absorb stuff you yeah. really don't want to be using things that have been totally drenched in chemicals and still have all of that in the cotton and it it doesn't last because it eats away at the fiber slowly. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, you can't use um, normal cleaners if they're stains. People use bleach to keep things white. With organic cotton, all we need is vinegar and baking soda to remove stains and also to keep it white. So mm -hmm. there's just so many reasons to spend the extra money. And then the weaving side of things for us, especially in a towel Maybe the towel itself looks the same as something you buy in the market, but the structure of a towel made on a loom is completely different than one made on a machine. So when we combine the organic cotton and the hand-woven looped uh, technique, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, We're the best towels in the entire universe. I love and it. And what a wonderful thing to be able to brag about, the, you yes. know, these people creating this quality. Yes. Well, you've, well, I'm going to say one thing. The skin is the biggest organ. So that is absolutely exactly. a, a huge factor that I hadn't actually thought of before, but very true um, in terms of like how towels work. And I didn't know how many chemicals are created to, or used to create a towel for the majority of towels. So lesson learned on my part, but you've kind of created a segue into the artisans. And I'm curious to know how long does it take to make a towel? (laughs) That's just a curiosity question. And then the looms are beautiful. I've seen them. uh, And I just think they're fascinating. I feel like I've used one somewhere because I remember like pushing the thing through the, um, you know what I'm talking about through the space and then tightening it with the thing the you bar. with the bar. So again, I'm asking a lot of questions at one time, but kind of overarching, I'm really curious to know more about the artisans and their process and, and their commitment to the art and to the culture. Um, so at the moment they care about making a living here in Turkey and yeah. you have to understand all my artisans are men. Yes. We lost our women in weaving yes. about 40 plus years ago. Mm-hmm. They did weave, but they wove at home for mm-hmm. home items. And their most important role, which is the sad part, is they were the teachers. Mm-hmm. So because of we're, we're a very large country in textile in the world, very large. And those commercially made items that were slowly filtering into the cities and then into the little towns i mean consumer choices were made they were being bought and then why make it at home so the loom at home out it goes and now we didn't just lose our women we lost our teachers right um, because you know as kids whether you were a boy or a girl you grew up next to mom learning about all of these things if you were a, a young man you went into a commercial setting if you were a young woman you were supposed to get married and fill that same role so um yeah they're all men and honestly the 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 heart and soul of what they're making even though I try to teach them at this point it's about I'm making a living in this and when I stop making a living in this I'll go do something else if you talk to young women about you know trying to teach them and I think I've mentioned to you for a long time I've been trying to work towards opening a weaving school Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to pay people and I will focus on women, but not exclude men um, to learn because the attitude is, oh, that's what my grandmother did. I buy my things in the department store. Mm. So I tend to compare the attitudes, right? And I'm being very general, but Mm -hmm. the attitudes are sort of like post-war America, factory Mm -hmm. bling and cheap, right? Mm -hmm. And we're lucky that we've hung on to this little thread and the the eight people nine people we started with they've brought people back to looms they all knew who each other were they don't like each other and they don't like cooperating these guys are really difficult to deal with sometimes but we've managed to grow the the weaver base Mm -hmm. higher than the loom base because we work now in shifts in most of the in most of the uh, workshops, um, but they know that I care. So um, I'm pretty picky about things because my clients are picky too, and rightfully so. They're paying a lot of money for a product that we're claiming lasts much longer and is better, and. Not everybody likes the little weaving anomalies or things that might make it look more handmade. A lot of people want it to look per- perfect, just like they bought in the store. So at the beginning, I bought everything from them just because they were going bankrupt. But then later, part of there was several things we had to, first of all, I had to get them off the threads they were using. That was an easy sell because they were buying very terrible quality threads at ridiculous prices because it was being brought to them. They couldn't afford to travel to go get them. Mm -hmm. So that part was easy. And I said, I'm in control of that. You no longer get to ever buy a thread again. So I know what's in it. 
changing the designs because machines were copying what the weavers were doing and then we were looking similar. That was harder. The hardest one was then saying, um, you know, you're not going to work 15 hours anymore. And if you're working in one of the workshops, there's not going to be alcohol because a lot of them were were drinkers. And, you know, (laughs) on the, on the six hour out comes the wine and then they're drinking. And by the 15th hour, I mean, they're creating garbage because they're in this mesmerized. So I said, okay, (laughs) eight hours. (laughs) Must be lots of fun. (laughs) Um, Eight hours, which was great for the weavers working in the atelier. No drinking, which most people accepted because usually they would start later in the day. But the head guys were all upset. It was like, oh, my God, then I'm going to need more people. How am I going to do this? It's like, no, you don't understand. Because I'm no longer going to pay you full price for something that's not sellable. Those pieces are going to go off into the corner. And you're, I'm going to take them. I will pay you. You won't lose anything, but you're not going to make the same profit. And by having shorter hours, it's a physical thing. Yeah. You know, our, our looms, the looms you're talking about. And I, I had the wonderful experience this last visiting in Edmonton to meet, um, uh, the Weavers Guild, because one of the the heads of the Weavers Guild in Edmonton, which I guess has existed for 70 years, and I didn't know, uh, was my client, and she invited me to speak to them. They're all using hand-thrown sh- uh, shuttle looms. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's slow. That's yes. really slow. Our guys have police, so you have a, um, it's, it's a handle with a rope, and it's, there's a triangle rope that then shoots the shuttle across. Oh, okay. And then you use pedals to move the heddles, which takes the warp and switches it back and forth. And as it's this way, the shuttle is shot across. And when it's the other way, it's shot across again. And the more pedals you have, the more complex the design can be. Really? So, Yeah, it is cool. So I'm jumping around a little bit, but... um, (laughs) <laughs> Touching everything. I gave you a lot of questions. All at once. <laughs> that wasn't fair on my part. <laughs> That's okay. The hours part, once we got that under control, the amount of quality products that were coming through got better. And then anytime that I saw issue, because we also have quality control in Istanbul as well, then we would sit and discuss it. Look, it can't be like this. It can't have this issue. We have to um, you know, reinforce this, or you're you're tying the fringe, the tassels to with too big a knots. And actually, the women do tassel tying and sewing of labels or sewing of seams if it's something that was cut. So women are still involved on a minor level, but not in the weaving side of things. Mm-hmm. So heart, heart for me, because I pay the big bucks. And there are, they're their own contractors and there have been people along the road that have ended up finding out where they were. We try to keep that kind of secret. Plus they don't like visitors at all. Um, But nobody would ever pay them what I did. So they've never left me. And I believe in paying them really well because it's hard work. They're creating a wonderful product and they deserve it. Yes. So I think that's another important component to what you're doing. You know, you can't underpay people like this. Yeah. You not only do you want the quality, it's, it's good for them too. And helps. And I want them to be loyal to me. I mean, I'm, I'm a businesswoman that's doing something very unique. Yes. If someone else comes in and says, well, I'm going to take these people. I lose as a business person, I'm losing for all my staff here in in Istanbul that are supported by this as well. So yes, I I have to pay them well as a business person, but also in my heart, this matters to me. I mean, you cannot underpay these kind of people. They need to be paid properly for what they're doing. Absolutely. And like you said, it's hard work. And it's also, you know, the teachers aren't as prevalent so that takes a little bit more on everybody's part. It's a learning curve for them, a learning curve for you. And um, I think just hearing everything you've done to 
make the business ultimately, I think is a really good lesson for all of us that it doesn't always go as planned, <laughs> right? No, yeah. no. And, um, you know, it's a pretty patriarchal society here. And this white Canadian woman with her very bad Turkish at that time, it's not even, it's not by any means perfect yet, but just marching in. The fact that I got to go into the workshops tells you how close to bankruptcy they were. And yes. in fact, the one man that did, did the towels that I told you he was 10 days away from giving up, it's his mother that dragged me in because I met her first tying tassels. And she dragged me in when she found out that I wanted all of what was sitting on her table, not just one piece. And he started yelling at her because she's brought a stranger in to steal his secrets. And it, yes. when I found out later... Man, you were going bankrupt. Like, what is your problem? She just brought you a client. Yes. It's kind of it's kind of bizarre there, but they I think when something is when people are going bankrupt in a certain interest industry, it's dog eat dog. Mm -hmm. And all of these people that survived all have terrible stories about even their own family members trying to drag them down to get above them, which is really sad. Yes. But I guess that's kind of human nature, isn't it? Yes, it's survival. That's, it's survival. And this yes. is where their paranoia comes from. Yes. Yeah. Which is fair in terms of yeah. history and experience and, and all the rest. But thank goodness that they have been able to come. I'm going to say come to terms with it. Maybe that's not the perfect language. And also they don't all get along perfectly you've been able to create something that um that works ultimately for everyone kind of like you said it's got to work for them they have to be paid well enough and it works for you because you're running a business and yeah and i i had to be fairly i mean the the only war i've never won is having visitors come and see them which is the other reason why i'm i really want to create a weaving school where uh, um, you know that I bought this little piece of land because my foundation application is stalled. So I'm trying to do it out of my own pocket and I need to grow. I have to grow that piece of land before I can present a project, but that would have a few glamping cottages where people mm -hmm. could stay, participate, learn, or just absorb, or observe. But if people can see all the effort that goes into it, because it's not just sit down at the loom and weave. You know, the threads come and then they've got to be turned into a war roll. That's a big deal. And you have to have skill there. You've got to put that on the back. You have to sit and thread the heddles, you yeah. know, and then you, ha you have to know how to do it right to get the designs that Jennifer wants. Otherwise, she's mad. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. Right. So yes. there's a lot of work involved. And then it comes off and it's got to be cut and tied and the rest of it. It's, yes. it's a lot. Yes. And when you're doing something handmade as well, not that manufacturing isn't somewhat complex, but when you're doing something handmade, it's just that much more, well, time and effort, I guess, is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, even even if they don't have the the passion, the level of passion that I want them to have, Mm -hmm. They still, there is still love for what they're doing mm -hmm. um, because you feel it in the product when you come in. And sometimes when people enter our shop or the showroom, I mean, they just can't help themselves touching everything. And you don't see them behaving that way in some of the other shops selling the small factory things. Mm. There is something in there because yeah. somebody's soul went into that to make it. Yes. So it, it it's interesting the energy that's created when when somebody makes something as opposed to just running it through the assembly line kind of thing. Yes. Well, I was going to end with that, but I'm not ready to end, but I'm going to say okay. this because it's it's something again that touched me when I was looking at your website. And it's that aspect of a human soul that weaves its way into a handmade piece. Incredible. Like that, that brings, like that actually is bringing tears to my eyes right now. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. I think that's, 
just a testament to the whole thing uh, in terms of what you're doing and the feel that people have. And I think you can tell the difference. Um, somehow, you know, not to go too woo-woo, but, you know, energetically or just that, um, yeah, that energy and love and history that goes into it, it is, you feel. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I, I think we don't have to be too woo-woo these days to know that there's there's lots of proof, even just in your own. So if we're talking about the business side of things, you know, you cheering on and mentoring people that are starting their own business. Yes. These thoughts going on here yes. are what are creating your feelings. And if you're if you're manufacturing <laughs> crappy <laughs> thoughts. Yes, um, you're not going to have good feelings and you're not going to have a good day while your business is at the beginning. And there's lots of challenges in any new business. And you yeah. have just got to stay positive to get over those little lumps and bumps. Yeah, because it it's it's no different for anyone start whatever business you're choosing yes. to do, whether you're selling buttons or doing what I'm doing or or opening, you know, a bar it doesn't matter there's going to be lumps and bumps and if yes. you give up too soon mm -hmm. then you're missing out on the best part and you'll always regret it absolutely you gotta just walk through those fears and challenges and stay positive i've yes. i've had to be lots of things that aren't part of maybe they're part of me now but i mean i've been a hard ass i've yelled at people <laughs> like, yes. it's like no we're not gonna do it this way we're doing it this way it's like believe in yourself and follow through with it i had yes. when i first went to open up the cafe i i talked to friends who are very wealthy entrepreneurs in canada and asked them you know what's your advice and a lot of they i was given very good advice but yes. a lot of them were like, I recommend you go work in a cafe for three years and pick up all the information you can and learn the business from beginning to end. And I was like, thank you. I don't have time for that. You're right. <laughs> I'm moving from Thailand. I'm going, I'm going to going Turkey <laughs> and I'm taking my whole nest egg and I'm opening this cafe. And yes. I'm pretty sure that I can learn how to, I know how to give good customer service and we're going to make good things and give good customer service. And I, yes. I did it. Maybe mm -hmm. I was crazy, but I did it and it was successful. Yeah. That's what brought me to then the next business. So yeah, it's possible. You just have to stay positive. So that that's same energy. Yes. It's what you think and feel creates energy. And this is what's happening with my pieces now that they're making. Yes. Yeah. I, I think you said so many incredible things in there and, it, and really good for everyone to hear because a lot of businesses fail early because people are afraid to go through whatever it is they're going, you know, whatever the bump is or the speed bump is, or kind of feel like that's the roadblock, but really we're our own worst enemies sometimes in restricting ourselves and ideas. And I'm, I'm going to give a, an example because I've just been going through a bunch of stuff and I think kind of highlights that a little bit too. Um, so I think, you know, I'm starting another, another business. Cause why not? Cause I love it. I'm very yeah. similar to you, right? I'm like, <laughs> okay, I sold a fabulous business and I've taken a little break and now it's time to go. So not just the empowerment <laughs> side, um, but also, uh, you know, in the healthcare world. So I'm building this website. I hired this guy. I, and my way I work, hire people is especially if it's online, I do this whole process and then I'm like, I'll give them a small project, nothing too big in cost, nothing too crazy, but just to see how things go. He did a great job on my first oh, little project. Good. Fabulous. So I hire him to do my website. Oh my God. <laughs> it has been Not quite. <laughs> so challenging, right? So I thought I got to get creative about this. So I actually brought someone I know here to my home yesterday and I was like, this is what I want. And we created it together. And so now it's getting there. It's not, not exactly where I want it, but I just had to like cut that tie. And I just said, 
and I, you know, I haven't fully finished that, that process, but I won't hire him again, but I had to get creative because it just wasn't working. And, yeah, and that's okay that. to make mistakes, right? Right. And it's okay. And so what, you know, everybody you hire is, ends up being who you think they are. And oh, no, no, yeah. and not everybody is going to stick with you to the ends of days. And some no. of what you teach and, you know, I believe you have to, I have to make the people that work for me the best they can possibly be. Yes. But here in Istanbul, for example, there's been lots of people that they don't want to be pushed to be the best they can be, number one. Yes. So they shoot out the other side of the toothpaste tube, not the side <laughs> I wanted. And that's <laughs> yes, okay. Exactly. You, you don't fit with us. That's okay. Yeah. You want to just sit and, and you know, punch something into a cash register and not have to talk to people. That's okay. Yes. But then there's the other people that learn so much, they feel confident to go off and do something on their own. Yeah. And, you know, before, when we were just at the beginning of hiring people, I would feel quite desperate, I think is the right mm -hmm. word. Like, oh my God, you can't leave me. Yes. But now if somebody comes to the door and says, I would like to leave, it's like, okay. Yes, I don't. And it's not because there's a whole lineup of people ready to replace them. There's not. Yes. But I'm much more mm -hmm. pragmatic about it because I know there is absolutely zero point keeping somebody with you that doesn't want to be there, number yeah. one. And then there's the unfortunate situation sometimes where people do want to stay, but you just can't keep them because it's not the right fit not and fit. it's yeah. not the right fit for the team. Um, and that's always hard to to drop people, mm -hmm. but it's going to happen. That's just a part of life. Mm -hmm. And if they do go off and be successful in something because you help them to yeah. learn something, feel good about it. Yes. Don't, don't be upset about it because mm -hmm. I think whenever you lift somebody up, you're only lifting up yourself as well. So I so agree that fits bang on with my values and I, I say blessing people forward. And yeah. if it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit for anyone. Even, um, even if they're making a living and even if they help you with your revenue and, you, you know, whatever it is, but if the vision isn't there and the values aren't aligned, then it's, it's painful for everyone, yeah. you know, ultimately. Yeah. And it doesn't help because if you have a team, yes. that person's going it, to, it, it starts to turn into a cancer for the team. It does. Because they're not happy. No. So let no. them go and let yeah. them be happy. Let them be happy. Yes. It's not a loss per se. I mean, mm -hmm. there's always, sometimes people just have a time they're supposed to be with you. And yes. that might be for a month or maybe it's a year or maybe it's 10 years. Yes. I don't know, but... Don't try to, don't try to beg people to stay with you because it never works. That's not at least my experience. It doesn't yes. work. I agree. And sometimes it's just time. And, yep. and I've had the same experience where I've had, I've had the great fortune of mentoring some people within my clinic, knowing they wanted to one day have their own and just in one person in particular, just an absolute incredible human and therapist and she was up front about it and I said okay well let's continue to build here and then we'll st you know uh, I am fine with you going and doing two days and seeing how you feel dipping your toe somewhere in terms of your own and now she has two clinics wow that's great and she's just fabulous and and what's interesting is <clears throat> she even has said to me that <laughs> at one point she's like, well, maybe I'll just manage like my clinic. Right. And she thought that would give her all the experience. And once she has now owned her own, she said, she really understands me better. And some of the things <laughs> that I set boundaries on. Right. And one of the things she said to me is like, you're really good at setting boundaries. And I did not think that like I wasn't, but I did have to. And with a big team, because at one point I did have a fairly big team, um, there was 
conflict. There was things that were challenging. And what was great about her, we could have an open, honest conversation about anything and work through it together. But she said it was way more than she had expected and really understood why I maybe didn't make the decisions that they wanted me to. (laughs) And, and that's, you know, like you said, you've been all of it. Right. And uh, we have to still follow what's right for our vision and our, Mm -hmm. our business and what's best for everyone within the business, even if it's not pleasing everyone. Yeah. Can't make everybody happy all the time. No. And they can never, they, the people who work for you, no matter how fantastic they are and what they do. Yes. And I have, I have some fabulous people with us, but they, they will never get the full vision yes. because they're not sitting in your shoes. Exactly. So it's, it's impossible. They, they think they know. Yes. But they don't really, and that's okay. They don't need Absolutely. to. Yes. Um, and if they if they want to venture off and find out for themselves, it's like good. And and I've yeah. had people come back too and go, oh, now I understand. Yes. <laughs> it's like, yes. Well, good. Yeah. I'm glad. That's exactly. a great thing to understand. Yes. Yeah. I even had somebody who left for a month and then asked to come back. And I was like, absolutely. And did you let? Absolutely. Because she had to go experience it. She's like, these things are all going to be better. And I said, okay. I said, "Uh, you realize that that means X, Y, Z. She's like, oh yeah, no problem. I'm like, okay, if that's what you want. Like it was a lot less support than what we provide for, for a therapist. And yeah, she was there a month and she realized, oh, this is not as easy as I thought, or it's not worth that extra money. Uh, because we needed some of that percentage to provide her with the services that we have. Like turnkey, she comes in, does her treatment, she leaves. And absolutely, she could have higher pay, but do your own billing, do your own laundry, do your own booking, do your own, like all those things. Mm -hmm. It costs for for the business, right? Um, And she was actually being paid very well. And she realized that when she went out and came back. And and again, that's fine. Like, that's totally okay. And if that had suited her, that's also okay. But she ended up with me for seven years. Well, there you go. She retired, right? So they, they don't all come back, obviously. Sometimes it's just not the right fit or they're ready to move on to something different. Um, or we're ready to bless them forward or <laughs> whatever yeah. the case may be. I think the key is not being, don't let it get it get you down as a business owner because yes. that's just part of having a team. Yes. And and what a wonderful thing if you get to the point in your business where you get to have a team. Yes. I love having a team. So do I. Yes. Yes. You know, it's it means at least here in Turkey, maybe maybe not in Canada, but here in Turkey it means I've got all sorts of people that I can tap into doing things that maybe I don't have time to do. And it might not be exactly in the scope of their job description, yes. but um, they're there. Yeah. And here in Turkey, that's an okay thing. Yes. I think maybe if I had a team in Canada, you have to be more stick to job description type mm-hmm. of things. I'm just imagining, but yeah, and remembering from working there. But <laughs> um, yeah, I love having a team. And, yeah. and then it's, it, you also sort of feel like you're not alone in the challenge, Absolutely. you know? Yes. Yeah. If, if you have the right people that you can um, brainstorm with and problem solve with, and they'll contribute in, in a positive way, it comes back to that positive, um, you know, see what's wrong, but what's the solution and not focus too much on the, on the what's wrong in terms of dwelling on it right? Step forward. What's the solution? Step forward. What's the solution? And try them. They're not always, they don't always work. Yeah. (laughs) The other thing I like, and maybe it sounds silly, but I just, I love knowing that, that my company is, is supporting people and they're making a living that, that allows them to have the life that they want. And that makes me happy. Yes, absolutely. 
I, I know some business owners here anyways that feel quite resentful when they have to pay their staff. And it's like, why in the world would you feel like that? <laughs> and it's like, that's one of the best. I, I don't do the payments anymore, but, you know, the, the accountant does it. But that's one of the best days of the month for me. It's like, yes, they yes. get to live a life that's fulfilled and they can pay their bills and keep their mm -hmm. their families fed and everything. And that makes that makes me happy. I find mm -hmm. it weird if that doesn't make a business mm -hmm. owner happy. Yes, I I agree. And that's part of the honor and the blessing and part of what I feel good about having been able to do. And way back when I started in business, it was one of my goals was to create a great place for people to work and to great. serve the team. So I am on board with that all the way. Yeah. Yeah. And even supporting them personally to a certain degree when needed, you're not getting yeah, that's certainly something in Turkey that happens a lot. So yeah. as a business owner, you are expected when, <laughs> Um, a staff comes to you and says, you know what, this has happened and I need this financial support or, um, or they want something and they want help with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You sort of become the bank because they, it's only recently since after I moved here that mortgages are a thing that, oh. um, credit cards are a thing. Right. Um, when I when I came here, people didn't have credit cards and people didn't have mortgages. Mm -hmm. So and a lot of people, for instance, my my husband's age have lived through banks going under and losing money. So they they have a distrust of banks. Yes. So then that whole system becomes on a more personal level. Mm -hmm. You build cre trust credits with your friends by, you know, asking for little loans and then you pay it back when you say you're going to, you go to your employer and you ask for help and then you, you know, you negotiate how much is going to be cut from their salary every month. And that's a very, very normal here thing here. Dang. Yes. So that's, for me, that was very different because I grew up in a family of neither a lender or borrower or bee. Yes. Kind of attitude, but, <laughs> yeah. but you can't have that attitude here. So yes. if you're ever opening a business in another culture, mm -hmm. um, you, you, when in Rome, you do have to be a yes. Roman under certain circumstances. I can be Canadian in lots of ways where things like the customer service matters and the quality matters, but then there's this whole other section where that's not going to work and I'm going to fail if I'm too Canadian. So I've got to adjust myself to their culture because I'm in their culture. Yes. You know, and I have to try to understand, even though, you know, many times it has to be explained to me. I, I have to do my best. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that could be just a fail right there. Yes. Yes. I can only imagine how, how that all gets integrated and the balance of it. <laughs> to figure out yeah the the expectations the cultural expectations and norms and well, again it's one of these situations where i didn't even know I, I still don't know many times what the questions are to ask because you don't understand how you've possibly um insulted or or whatever it is i mean strange things have happened over the last <laughs> 17 years where it's like how in God's name was I supposed to know that? Right. Like, well, everybody knows that. It's like, no, no, <laughs> not no. everybody. Yeah. And they're like, and you didn't ask the question. You're like, I didn't know the yeah. question to ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, those are just part of the challenges of, of deciding to do business here. But there's, yes. I'm sure there's no less challenges in a place that's as multicultural as, as uh, Canada as well, where you're, Probably not just hiring people who grew up there. Yes. You may have to hire other people from other cultures. So you have to mm -hmm. sort of understand on some level with boundaries, as we were talking yes. about, yes, who you're dealing with if you're going to yes. be successful. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is respecting, respecting their beliefs and culture as well. 
and um, yeah, and and but values can still align in a lot of ways. So there's interesting mixes that for sure occur, but also very interesting. Yeah, well, it's, for me, it's part of the learning, and yes. that's what keeps you young, right? If you can keep on learning and understanding and and mm -hmm. growing that base, because even after seventeen years. And then we got the farm and now you're with the villagers. Mm -hmm. It's different than working with the weavers who are also in villages and they are villagers. Now we're, it's, it's a whole nother layer of culture mm -hmm. that I really hadn't experienced as a land owner in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's, it's made me feel quite ignorant about a culture I've been living in in 17 years. So wow. it's, it's, it's been a learning curve, but an enjoyable one. I've been enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Well, from our previous conversation, it sounds like you're really passionate, passionate about that next project. And well, I'm, I'm going to do my very best, but mm -hmm. I have decided with, with all the, because I do get very, very passionate and excited. And then when things, you know, sometimes the universe is trying to help you out and it puts roadblocks up and it, it's not just about, well, I can get through this and barrel through it. Sometimes it's actually saying right now you need to turn left mm -hmm. and I can be quite stubborn in that. Yeah. But, but I need to go through this because that's where I'm going. And mm -hmm. I've realized with the, with the stalling of the foundation application, which would have allowed me to be a legal foundation and get donations from people for the big, big project. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually in hindsight, probably a good thing because just this five acres and taking it from chemically managed to organic, because it has to be managed organic if we're going to have guests and feed them and, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't match the ethos of making handmade things with organic yes. fibers. <laughs> um, and plus, I, I believe, I think we need to feed ourselves better as well. But that's been a lot, mm. like a way bigger thing than I ever thought it was going to be. So I kind of have to thank the universe for stalling something that I might have just fallen flat on my face because it would have been too much. I needed this first. And I, I haven't given up, but there, there is going to be, it's a different path now. Yes. And I just have to be open to the fact that maybe there might be other blocks, but if I'm listening and paying attention, I will try to discern what is a challenge that I'm supposed to climb over top of and what is a, a warning saying, okay, not this way, please, a little bit that way. It doesn't mean that you have to give up. But it may mean you have to adjust. And I know that us entrepreneurial A-type crazy people tend to just like, oh, I got to go. I have to go this way. That and was my plan. Forget that <laughs> it's, it's okay to make little detours sometimes. It doesn't mean you failed. It just means you had to take a different path to get yes. us somewhere. Yes. So I that, that's hard that. learning for me personal mm -hmm. learning mm -hmm. that's yeah. actually harder for me than all that other stuff that other stuff is just uh, hmm. and i'm not trying to put myself down but sort of or or build myself up but it's sort of like me barreling over people to get them to do what i want them to do. <laughs> um, and that a, doesn't always work either <laughs> no but a lot of times it does yeah um but that whole personal self-personal learning thing that part I find harder mm -hmm. and because I tend not to listen as much as I should listen. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had advice about that, it would be like, don't think you're failing just because you can't take the exact path you thought you were supposed to take. It might yes. not be the right one. And it doesn't mean you're failing. It just means you're taking a different road. Yes. Sometimes you have to zag a little. And sometimes it's only like a few degrees. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, and that's all you need or a mind shift somewhere. And uh, again, I can certainly understand that because one of the things I've worked on over the years is just trusting my gut. 
doesn't always make sense. And it and zagging when I need to zag and sitting in it for a while while I'm figuring it out. And mm-hmm. things go slower than than we want sometimes. I can say that with with some of the things I'm currently doing. It's like <laughs> this is damn website, let me tell you. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to launch all my, you know, my marketing materials and, and that isn't ready. So um but you know what? Sometimes that's just how it is and it will get done and I'm okay. And and all of those wonderful things about us that make us successful are also those things that makes us anxious and feeling like, what the hell? And yeah. it's it's a blessing and a curse all in one. And if you can Absolutely. manage to balance those things so mm-hmm. that you're not pulling out your hair because, you know, some carpenter is telling you, we don't do mitered corners in, in Turkey. And it's like, are you out of your mind? Just give me the saw and I'll do it. <laughs> and, <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> whatever. It's just like, just take a chill pill because not all of it is important. It doesn't matter if, you know, all the caps on the pen are red and they're all facing this way. There's been a lot of people, I have a lot of wholesale clients and, and, um, some of them have been like, but I have to have everything in order before I can start. And from my perspective, it's like, no, you need stock so you can start selling because nothing will ever be completely in order. You will never have everything perfect. Mm-hmm. And I, my now husband, I met him when I was in my third month of, of uh, renovations on my cafe, the first business. Mm-hmm. And he came in one day, he said, you have got to open the cafe now. You have to start earning money now. It's like, oh no, it's not ready yet. Because I was so deep into to the renovations, making everything perfect. And then he came in the second day and he's like, you must open the doors now. You have to. And I was like, no, it's not ready. By the sixth day, <laughs> and you have to understand, this is three months of renovations that I hope was going to be six weeks. And everybody else told me it's going to take a year in Turkey. <laughs> um, but by this, this sixth day at the end of three months, he was like literally yelling at me, open the goddamn door now. You know, just <laughs> You must make money now. <laughs> it's like, okay. Like, that's hilarious. And then I opened the doors and I was just sitting there petrified. Well, what the hell do I do now? Because I had been so focused on this one step of the business that it's like, ah, oh, what's next? Yes. But it works out. It's sort of like the first day of, of Jennifer's hammam. I mean, I was bent on the fact this is going to succeed because everybody loves good towels and these are going to be really great towels. And my first day open, somebody came in, uh, we have in the hammam, they use something called keze, which are exfoliation mitts. They're amazing. And um, a bunch of people came in and bought nothing. And one person came in and bought, I don't know, it was like at the time, a $10 uh, keze or something. I don't know what it was, but I know it was a keze. And I went home. And I bawled my eyes out. It was like, uh-huh. oh, my God, I've made the biggest mistake of my entire life. And then I got up the next day and said, you need to go to work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the other thing. There will also be these moments where it's like, I've, I'm, I've made the biggest mistake ever. What was I thinking? And then you just got to get yourself out of bed and go back to work. Because yes. it's fine. It'll be fine. And it was fine. fine. Yes. That first month just went shoom, and then the second month even bigger, and it was just like, whoa. Yes. So it it'll be fine if you believe in it, and it's okay if you have moments of nervous breakdowns as long as they're moments, and that other part of you kicks you out of bed to go back to work. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> and we have to take imperfect action. You don't know what you don't know perfect. until you know it. So yeah, just do you something. Start, start something. Somewhere is better than nothing yes right yes it's bang on i agree amazing i feel like we should wrap it up there because that is just whatever you like strong a strong statement to (laughs) to leave with i could talk to you for hours i know this has been so much fun so i think we should do another one we'll do a part two at some point if you want sure sure Um, we'll build on that but uh 
yeah, I just love, I love what you're doing. I love thank you what you've created. I think you're such a great example um, to women. You know, I support a lot of women. And I know you do. I think it's fabulous. You're yeah. Doing that. Yeah. So entrepreneurs who, and, and I'm just going to say this too. I think it's a really good example that you are creating something within a culture um, that is maybe, you know, like you said, patriarchal, like there's just, it, it's a very immersed culture in that way. And yet you're succeeding. And I think that's important that you have found a way and kind of weaved your way through that um, to, to make it happen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm honored that you asked me to be part of this and I hope, I hope there's some little bits and bobs of benefit for, for people who are listening. Yeah. And certainly anybody coming to Turkey better, (laughs) better knock down our doors at Jennifer's mom and say, I know who Jennifer is and you better call her because I'm never on site anymore. I'm either working off site or in my farm. You're always welcome to have my, make my staff call me. Wonderful. And I will include your website so people can go look at it and see what you do. And thank you. Well, we have our, press i can't even remember what i call it anymore press plus something um and i'll i'll backlink to you as well so that oh that is what you're doing oh thank you because you shouldn't just be helping people where you live you should be helping people all over because look at this this platform allows us to connect even though we might not be in the same city exactly which is what i love about it yes thank you so much i'm so grateful For you. Have a warm day. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> we went from I minus to one at some point. To plus seven today. <laughs> and I know you were minus 44 the other day. So I'm sorry. <laughs> oh gosh. I'll be there soon. <laughs> I'm flying to Thailand on Thursday. Oh, so I'm gosh. gonna go even another step the other direction. Oh my gosh. Beautiful. Well enjoy it. Yeah. Mwah. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. Lots. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining this episode of Empowerment TV and the Empowerment Podcast. I'm so grateful for all of you for listening in and supporting these incredible people who are doing wonderful work in the world. And remember, keep believing in yourself and keep believing in your dreams. You have everything it takes to make them all happen. I'll see you next time.